Hello and welcome to some video notes. Today we'll be talking about topic 6.6. .6. Uh, we'll be doing the first half of 6.6. .6. We'll be focusing on the endocrine system. So that means we'll be talking about the hormones that are secreted from glands, go into the blood, and then go around to different parts of the body, uh, affecting different targets, tissues to cause an effect and help you control you know, the different systems that make up your body. Uh, we're talking about how hormones lead to maintaining certain levels of homeostasis, like your blood glucose levels. And then we'll be getting into the topic of reproduction. So we'll be talking about how hormones are uh, responsible for the, the different genders and characteristics of those genders. Uh, and then also getting into the reproductive organs themselves, because you also have to know the male and female reproductive organs and the vocabulary that goes with them. And then after that, we'll be getting into the second part. And in another series of notes, we'll be specifically focusing on the menstrual cycle, which is part of reproduction, but is also heavily regulated by hormones. So it's all connecting back to this idea of hormones and how they affect the body. You have failed me for the last time. So your endocrine system, just like all of the other systems that we've learned about, like your respiratory and your circulatory and your digestive system, uh, it has a very specific function. But unlike uh, those systems, which kind of have very, very specific sections that are all connected to each other, the endocrine system is made up of a varying different glands and different parts of the body that ultimately are just connected to the body through the circulatory system. So even though the circulatory system is necessary for these things to move around the body, for the hormones to move around the body, uh, we don't consider the, the vesicles, the blood vesicles, as part of the endocrine system, just the glands themselves and ultimately the hormones they're going to release. So uh, the endocrine system is there to basically uh, react, have your body react to certain stimulus. And so as stimulus is received by your body and, and it's processed, uh, both by your, you know, by your nervous system um, and by different regions of your brain, there are different systems that can help to create a response. So we've already talked about the nervous system and how the nervous system is able to generate responses and take the stimuli in and to produce an output. Now, the endocrine system is a different method for dealing with changes within the body themselves. And so it's not necessarily a whole bunch of stimulus from outside the body. It's the organism. Uh, it's the internal features of the organism. So if you remember, we talked about the concept of homeostasis. And these are these steady set points that everything is supposed to be around in order for us to maintain healthy cells and ultimately a healthy body. So for example, we have a set point of about 37 degrees Celsius as our body temperature. We try to maintain that temperature. We don't always stay at that temperature though. If we get too hot, then we sweat, right, to try to cool ourselves down. If we get too cold, then we shiver to try to warm ourselves back up again. So when we think about uh, homeostasis, we're thinking about maintaining these internal levels, right? So our body temperature, the amount of salt in our tissue, the amount of water in our tissue, the amount of other, you know, various other material that's transmitted through your blood, like CO2 and oxygen. And so the endocrine system is going to help uh, regulate those different levels. And so it's going to do this by releasing hormones. And so hormones are these chemical signals that will go directly into the blood. So endo is the idea that it's internal or within. So it's not exocrine, which was part of the digestive system, right, which leave the body. <coughs> Endocrine will stay in the body, inside the blood. And so they will travel around the blood and they will interact with what they call a target tissue. And so a hormone can only affect a target tissue because a hormone whatever chemical is used, or uh, most of them are, are going to be proteins, um, they're designed to fit a very specific receptor on those target cells. And so they can bump in and interact with a whole bunch of tissue that's not the target tissue, and they won't, won't really do anything to it because they can't interact with any receptors that are on the surface of those cells inside that tissue. However, when they do run into the target's tissue, the reason why they cause an effect is because they're interacting with specific receptors, either inside or on the surface of the cell membrane of those uh, target cells and target tissues. And typically what will happen is some stimulus will cause the release of the hormones. When the hormones attack, or not attack, but they attach to or interact with a target tissue, they're gonna cause some type of internal change. All right, and then internal change ends up um, 
changing the stimulus or re reducing or getting rid of the stimulus that is causing the system to react in this way in the first place. So ultimately the feedback or the response will then stop the whole system from occurring again. So then it's again another example of a negative feedback system. So just like the idea of your body temperature, your body temperature goes too high. So your body detects that your body temperature is too high. You're particularly your brain is going to detect that. It's gonna send out hormones. It's gonna trigger you to sweat. You're going to sweat, which is going to decrease your body temperature, cool you down. Uh, your brain is then going to detect that your body is cooled down, and then for it's going to stop releasing the hormone that's causing you to sweat, which therefore stops your sweating, which you know stops the response. And so the feedback and it ultimately inhibits the response because the response is getting rid of the stimuli. So that's our negative feedback system. So uh, in the endocrine system, there's a whole bunch of glands, but we're only going to focus on some really key important ones. There's there's eight that you need to be familiar with. Now we're going to talk about some um, different hormones that are re released by them and um, uh, where they go inside the body. So we have the pineal gland up here in the in the midbrain, right there in the center section of your brain there. And then you have the pituitary gland, which is right there near the hypothalamus. There's going to be a lot of interaction between the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland as we talk about different hormones and what they do. Then going down around your voice box, there's your thyroid, right? If you guys remember, we talked about iodine being an important uh, nutrient because it reduces hyperthyroidism or inflating of the thyroid. There's the thyroid gland there around the... Um, voice box in the neck. Then down, going down into your chest, there's the thymus. Then your adrenal glands, which are on top of the kidneys. Each kidney has a little gland on top of it. You have the pancreas, which I kind of drew it there between the, uh, the kidneys, but I wouldn't say that's actually where it would be. I think they should have drawn it more over here on this side of the abdomen. But the pancreas, which again is part of the digestive system. The pancreas also has a major role in regulating your blood glucose levels. Then the last two depend on your sex. If you're a female, you have your ovaries, which are there for regulating your, uh, the female side of reproduction and, of course, female char sex uh, characteristics. And if you're a male, you have testes, which are there for the male side of reproduction and, of course, the male characteristics of uh, sex characteristics. Okay, so we're going to go into more detail about these uh, different hormones that can be released by these organs, uh, by these glands, and uh, what they're going to do to the body. So the first uh, example we're going to talk about, and it's one that you should know pretty well because it does show up on tests uh, a good amount, is this idea of the pancreas and how the pancreas is interacting with the liver and other cells in the body to regulate our blood glucose levels. And really what we have is we've got two different responses by the pancreas depending if we are having too much blood sugar or too little blood sugar. So either the blood sugar goes up because we've just eaten something and through the digestive process we've absorbed a lot of glucose into our blood which made the blood glucose levels go higher or it's been a long time since we've eaten something so as we burn more and more energy to keep our bodies alive the amount of blood glucose uh, is starting to drop too low in our blood and so we need to replenish those blood glucose levels by glucose that has been stored in the liver by glycogen or maybe even start to break down fat tissue and convert it into glucose. Okay, so looking at these two different systems, let's start where the blood glucose level is really high. So let's say you just had a big meal and for the next few hours your blood glucose level is going to be relatively high. So what's going to happen is the pancreas is going to detect that the blood glucose levels are relatively high and then Actually, the brain's going, the hypothalamus is going to detect it, and the hypothalamus is going to, get to stimulate the pancreas. But ultimately, the pancreas has beta cells, and these beta cells are going to secrete a special hormone called insulin. So if you remember, we've talked about diabetes before. Diabetes, uh, if someone who's diabetic might not be able to produce insulin or might not produce a very effective insulin. So they might be insulin dependent. So they might have to inject insulin themselves into their own tissue fluid rather than have the insulin be made by the pancreas itself. So the pancreas will release the insulin into tissue fluid and ultimately into the blood. And as it travels through the body, eventually hits the target cells, right, of the liver and uh, sometimes uh, muscle or fat cells as well. And so uh, what it does is it um, gets the muscle cells, liver cells, fat cells to increase the uptake of glucose. So if you remember, glucose is actually a pretty large molecule, so it doesn't move through the cell membrane very easily. 
So to increase the rate of the uptake of glucose, insulin is going to affect the liver cells and fat cells and muscle cells and get them to have more of a transport protein, which will allow glucose to pass through the cell membrane and therefore get into the uh, cells and then ultimately get changed into glycogen for storage. So because of insulin, we see an increase in the rate of the absorption of glucose from the blood and then ultimately being stored in things like your fat cells, your liver cells, and your muscle cells. So as the glucose starts to get absorbed, eventually the levels go back um, to normal and so then when the level goes back to normal the again being detected by a hypothalamus and stimulating the pancreas um, we no longer have to secrete insulin or, or or the pancreas will stop secreting insulin because we've gotten our blood glucose levels back to normal now on the other side of that let's say the blood glucose levels are too low so it's been you know hours you know you skipped uh, breakfast and you know you maybe didn't get a snack during the day and so you've got you know a late lunch and so you've really got a good amount of time without eating but you're still burning all of this energy to keep yourself alive so you need to replenish those glucose levels during this fat, uh, fasting period so what's going to happen <coughs> is again the detection of the blood uh, glucose levels will will be occur so that we realize that the blood glucose levels are quite low the pancreas will get stimulated to release glucagon from alpha cells so remember beta cells make insulin alpha cells make glucagon okay and so uh, the alpha cells release glucagon glucagon again going into the blood traveling around the body it's going to interact with things like the liver and some fat tissue places where glycogen has been stored and it's going to have the opposite effect of insulin. It's going to increase the breakdown of glycogen, increase the release of glucose, so that the blood glucose levels go back up, so that we have more blood, or sorry, more glucose in our blood, so that we have the energy necessary in order to, you know, keep ourselves alive until we get to eat again. And then once the blood glucose levels return to a more normal level, the pancreas stops releasing glucagon because we don't need to release this energy anymore because we already um, got back to our regular homeostasis, our set point of the amount of glucose necessary in the blood in order to keep us alive. So here we've got two different systems, our insulin system and our glucagon system, and it all depends if we have a situation where we either have too much glucose in our blood or not enough glucose in our blood. Okay, so here is an opportunity to practice a question like this, a test question. Here we got a longer form, eight mark question. So uh, you pause it and you got a chance to give it a shot. Okay, so when approaching a question like this, uh, because it's looking at blood glucose control in general, there are two different systems that you can be commenting on to get marks for, obviously if the blood glucose levels are too high or too low. But you could start off by some just general information about uh, blood glucose regulation that applies to both systems. So things that you could say would be that, first off, that this is all going to be done by pancreatic cells, which are um, releasing hormones to regulate the blood glucose levels, right? And we, our blood glucose levels go up because we absorb blood glucose, or we absorb glucose into our blood through the process of digestion from, you know, absor or absorbing the material that we eat. More versus, you know, if we're fasting, then um, blood glucose levels will go down, right? Uh, the regulation of this is a negative feedback system, so they're trying to maintain a certain level of blood glucose, uh, and then if it goes too low or too high, uh, the system kicks in, and then of course once we've hit that point, or we've reset it back to the regular homeostatic point, then the system turns itself off. And of course this is being regulated by hormones like insulin and glucagon. So then once you've got this general information down, you can start talking about the specific systems. So if it's too high, the beta glucose is going to release, <coughs> sorry, the beta cells are going to release insulin. Insulin stimulates the uptake of glucose by the muscle cells and the fat cells and the liver cells. This also triggers them to store glucose as glycogen. And so ultimately this leads to a decrease in the blood glucose levels. If the blood glucose levels are too low, we have the reverse. We have the alpha cells releasing glucagon. Glucagon is going to stimulate the breakdown of glycogen into glucose, and therefore glucose is going to be released into the blood, which leads to an increase in their blood sugar levels. And <coughs> it's very key to remember uh, the beta and alpha cells. And so there are many examples of tests in the past where if you don't have that key piece of information of beta cells versus alpha cells, when answering a certain question, 
uh, you won't get the mark. So you need to make sure you do remember that it's beta cells releasing insulin and it's alpha cells releasing glucagon. So now that we've talked about blood glucose levels, let's talk about a disease that connects to uh, that specific example of blood glucose regulation, and that would be diabetes. So diabetes means that someone has a difficulty either producing insulin or controlling the amount of insulin or the effectiveness of their insulin. And so as a result of that, their blood glucose levels are difficult to maintain at a steady point, particularly after they've eaten. And there are two different types of diabetes, type 1 and type 2, and they have different um, symptoms and they occur at different times depending on um, whether or not you're born with the condition versus something that you gain later through uh, unhealthy habits, for example. So if we're thinking about type 1, we call that early onset. Typically people are born with this or they develop very, very early in their life. And in this kind of situation, uh, they consume food, right? Their blood glucose levels go up. This will stimulate the pancreas. And the pancreas does not produce enough insulin. So as a result, not enough insulin stimulates the cells. And we don't really have um, the, the proper reduction of the glucose uh, in the blood. And so uh, over time, uh, their blood glucose levels will just keep going higher and higher and higher because the pancreas isn't really able to produce the insulin necessary to do this. So in this instance, this would be someone who um, typically uh, there's some hereditary concerns to it. So normally it's something leading back to genetics. Uh, possibly the, the beta cells have been destroyed and then ultimately insulin production could stop. So either they don't produce enough insulin or they just don't produce insulin at all uh, because of uh, this hereditary issue. When we look at type 2, that is onset or late onset or adult onset diabetes. And so in this situation, again, the glucose levels will go up because they ate something. This stimulates the pancreas. The pancreas doesn't, uh, will, sorry, will produce insulin, but the insulin just doesn't really affect the liver and muscle and fat cells, or there aren't really enough receptors for it to probably affect the, the body. And so ultimately, again, the same result is that the blood glucose levels don't really drop down to where they need to be. And if you don't have proper medication or treatment, the blood glucose levels will just continue to increase and increase and eventually cause a lot of health problems. So uh, there could be a hereditary connection to all of this, uh, but it's also related to poor um, um, diets and obesity as well. Okay, so if someone has um, not getting enough exercise and they become obese and they're eating overly sugary foods or things that just weigh too much glucose inside of their body, uh, this uh, you know, decades of this lifestyle can degrade the efficiency of the insulin that's being produced by their pancreas and ultimately leading to uh, adult onset diabetes. And so fewer insulin receptors in the liver, uh, less sensitivity to the insulin, all right, so they might become insulin dependent or they might just need uh, some medication that helps them with um, the production of their receptors. And so they can either artificially increase the amount of receptors through medication, or they might need to modify um, the insulin levels to, to, and of course their diet and their health choices as well, uh, in order to help to bring their body back into control. And then they might just be insulin dependent for the rest of their life. Okay, so these are the two different types of diabetes, uh, really depending on uh, why the diabetes is occurring and then which point in life is it coming from. So moving on from the pancreas, we're now gonna talk about other hormones that are responsible for maintaining different homeostatic points inside of your body. Next, we're gonna be looking at thyroxin. Thyroxin is produced by your thyroid gland, the one that's in your neck, right? Uh, and it targets most of the body because it's there for regulating your metabolism. It's there for helping to increase um, metabolic rates and to help maintain uh, protein synthesis rates because it's also there tied to heat production and increased respiration. So when your, uh, your body is too cold, for example, thyroxin levels will increase to try to artificially raise your body temperature by triggering your cells to do more metabolic activities, which causes them to use up more ATP, which ultimately results in a little bit more heat energy being produced, which should raise your body temperature. Uh, if a lot of thyroxins are getting produced, um, the effect of that can lead to um, shivering, all right? And so shivering is these kind of muscle spasms that are causing lots of rapid muscle contractions in different parts of your body. Uh, and so those rapid muscle contractions cause you to burn a lot of ATP, um, <coughs> which therefore should help to raise your body temperature. 
The next one is leptin, which we've already talked a little bit about leptin in the digestion stuff and topic and option as well. So leptin is produced by your adipose tissue or your fat cells, basically the cells designed to store fat. And it's an appetite controlling um, hormone. And so if you increase the amount of fat cells in your body, uh, then you for it start to increase the concentration of leptin in your blood and leptin eventually affects the hypothalamus uh, where your uh, appetite control center is going to be located and helps to suppress your appetite because you've got more than enough nutrition, you don't need to keep uh, eating it. So uh, an effect of this is an increase in the apodose teach, um, tissue increases leptin secretion in the blood. Oh, yeah, so that's what I just said. And this causes the appetite inhibition and hence will help reduce your food intake. So if you've eaten enough food, all right, the reason why you stop feeling hungry, part of the reason, there's various things that are connected to it. But part of the reason uh, that helps with the suppression of your appetite by eating is because it affects your leptin levels, which therefore regulates your uh, hypothalamus and the appetite control center. And the reason why they have these little mice here in this example is because we're looking at a study where they're trying to see if leptin injections could be used for treatment of obesity. And so here we're looking back in 1949, scientists discovered that um, obese mice basically are a mutant version of the mouse that eats excessively um, and so therefore becomes profoundly obese. So rather than regulating its own appetite, it just keeps eating and eating and eating and eating and of course because it's taking all this extra nutrition, uh, it's starting to get fatter and fatter as it gets more and more adipose tissue. And so they found out that the way this occurred is that, that the mice, the obese mice, had now possessed two recessive alleles that consequently reduced and then ultimately took away the production of leptin. And so they didn't really produce leptin, so they really didn't have anything controlling their appetite. Well, they had one less thing controlling their appetite. Appetite control is not just done by leptin, but it's done by different things. But one of the factors, like leptin, uh, was taken away, and so they had a harder time just controlling their appetite. So they continued to eat as long as the food was present. All right, so the obese mice then were treated with leptin, and they saw a, a significant uh, drop in their weight. So by giving them a leptin injections, they were able to have the leptin affect their appetite control center, help to reduce the amount of food that they would want to eat. Their appetite went down, and so then they started to lose weight because they weren't eating as much. So clinical trials were carried out to see if we had similar effects, but they failed, right? Most people already have a naturally high level of leptin, all right? So if linked to leptin, obesity in people would be due to resistance right, of the appetite control center of leptin. So people that are obese, it's not that they don't produce leptin, like the example of the mice here, it's that the leptin that they produce is not as effective. All right? They're still producing lots of it, but the receptors in the appetite control center of your hypothalamus have become resistant to it, and so the high concentrations of the leptin isn't really having an effect anymore. So very few patients, uh, when given leptin as an injection form, uh, had any type of significant weight loss. And so it didn't really, it wasn't really effective as an actual method for controlling weight loss uh, in people. Okay, and one more example you should know about before we move on to talk about um, sex hormones and sex determination. Melatonin. So melatonin comes from your pineal gland. Remember that really small one right in the middle of your brain? And uh, basically, the pineal gland is responding to the amount of light and darkness that you're being exposed to. And when the pineal gland is releasing melatonin, um, it's going to affect your pituitary gland and a whole bunch of other glands. So it actually affects a whole bunch of other things in your body, like, for example, some of your appetite, some of your alertness, uh, your grogginess. So I'll give you an example of this. Oh, sorry, it's the effects of it. What it's, it's there for is to help synchronize your circadian rhythms, so including sleeping and blood pressure regulation, and also connects a little bit to your appetite. So um, circadian rhythm is this idea um, that we are regulated by the amount of light that we're exposed to. And so this is one of the reasons why they say, uh, you know, you shouldn't be looking at super bright phone screens and computer screens at night because you're artificially stimulating your circadian rhythm because even though it's dark outside, uh, you're getting this bright light stimulation, which is making your brain think that it's actually like more of a daytime versus a nighttime. And so our brains have developed to react to sunlight. And so when we start to perceive high energy photons, right, like sunlight, 
um, it hits our retina, and then that sends in information to the brain, and by activating that part of our eye, and then ultimately parts of our brain, it helps to start this this the these this uh, clock down or this um, sorry this uh, kind of internal timer made of proteins inside of your body and different parts of your brain that say like okay we, we've started the day and so so much time into the day we should be eating so much more time into the day we should be we might start to feel a little groggy another so much time into the day we should be eating again and then after so many time, hours of being awake we should start to sleep, right? And we should go back to sleep. It's starting to get dark out. We have less stimulation from light. And so that is the circadian rhythm. It's this natural progression of homeostatic points in your day as you go from being awake to being asleep. And melatonin also has a big effect on this. So some of you have probably experienced what happens when we throw off our melatonin by moving to a different part of the earth very, very quickly, uh, ultimately affecting the length of time of night or day artificially more than it should be. Right? So jet lag, for example, if you travel from one part of the world to the other very, very quickly, if you left at 8 in the morning uh, and then you arrived at 10 in the morning wherever you're going, all right, but you traveled for quite a long time, let's say you traveled for like 6 or 7 hours, but you still arrived only a few hours after you left in terms of the time zones. So um, you've got this extra like seven or eight hour long day than you normally shouldn't be able to have. And so that has an effect on your body, the idea that you're exposed to so much more light for such a long period of time. So uh, because melatonin secretion is also going to um, be connected to the amount of darkness versus the amount of light that you're being exposed to. So jet lag, of course, if you're not familiar with it, it's this idea that you can't really sleep regularly, you might get headaches, fatigue, you might be irritable, you also might have some problems with appetite, you might not be hungry when you normally should be and things like that. And typically after a few days of being exposed to a normal, once again, you know, so many hours of light, so many hours of darkness, you know, so many hours awake, so many hours of sleep, um, you go back to, to being normal. Um, but if you're having a really, really hard time with jet lag, it's because jet lag um, uh, caused by the pineal gland uh, not really linking up with the circadian rhythm. So the idea that the pineal gland's activity isn't necessarily linked with the regular circadian rhythms triggered by the amount of light. So what you can do is that you could take melatonin, all right, which would cause you uh, close to the time that you're going to sleep, uh, for the destination and this would alleviate the symptoms a little bit. So you could artificially um, boost your melatonin levels just by taking a melatonin pill and so then that should help to regulate the hormonal side of your endocrine system that's helping to regulate uh, these feelings. And then when you get to the new destination, you should slip into the daylight and nighttime uh, time frame uh, a lot easier because of those artificially boosted melatonin levels. All right, the next part, the last part we're going to be going on with is this idea of the sex determination and how the hormones like the ovaries and the testes uh, affect the overall development of a person. So if you don't quite remember, sex determination comes from the idea of your X and Y chromosomes. You have 23 pairs of chromosomes, right? 22 pairs are the autosomes because you automatically get them. You have to have them to be alive, where the sex chromosomes are one of two different sets. You either have XX or you have XY, right? Uh, essentially, the Y chromosome is only in existence for giving you the SRY gene, which is the gene that ultimately ends up with the production of testosterone, high levels of testosterone, and um, some other hormones we're not going to get into that lead to the development of male characteristics and ultimately makes a person into a male. Uh, the X chromosome um, has a whole bunch of other things in addition to female um, uh, hormones like estrogen and progesterone levels um, coming from the X chromosome. You also have a whole bunch of other uh, features like color vision and the ability to clot blood. Uh, that's going to be on the X chromosome as well. So everybody needs an X chromosome, uh, but the Y chromosome is optional depending if you're going to be a female or a male. All right. So the X chromosome, because it has a lot more other things on it, um, it's, it's much larger than the Y chromosome. It's not really homologous. They're not homologous pair. Right, the X and Y chromosomes, they code for different things, okay? So, uh, and then of course has the SRY gene, which is needed for male development. So then moving on to think about the SRY gene. So in embryo, the first appearance of the gonads, and the gonads are like what eventually become your ovaries or your testes. So they're undifferentiated reproductive uh, organs 
of your reproductive glands of the person, right? And so the gonads have to develop either into ovaries or testes, depending on if the SRY gene is present. So if the SRY gene is present, then codes for a protein called TDF or testes determining factor. And so the testes determining factor will um, bind to DNA protein, is a DNA binding protein which acts as a transcription factor, uh, promoting the expression of other genes. So because of the TDF, we get expression of more genes that lead to the development of male characteristics, all right? So in, if the gonads are in a development of an embryo that has a TDF, then the gonads should develop into testes. Uh, if TDF is not present, then they go down the regular already established path of just developing into ovaries uh, when the embryo eventually starts to develop in the fetus. So if you think about testosterone versus estrogen and progesterone, how they affect the body, so we have the, the gonads and they're undifferentiated, all right? So testosterone is present, TDF is present, and that leads to development of the testes and the other male characteristics, right? So the testes start to develop from the undifferentiated gonads, embryonic gonads, right? And so uh, because the testes are produced, because the gonads develop into these testes, they start producing high levels of testosterone. Now it's true that men have both testosterone and estrogen and progesterone and women also have estrogen progesterone and testosterone as well we all have the same amount of the same types of hormones it's just the amount of them so men have significantly higher levels of testosterone versus women who have much higher levels of estrogen and progesterone so because of those very very high levels as we, we get these differences that occur so because the gonads developed into testes the testes produce very very large concentrations of testosterone. And so testosterone is the hormone that eventually causes male characteristics, secondary sex, sex characteristics, and puberty. So uh, the idea of sperm production is going to be caused by high levels of testosterone. The sexual, secondary sexual characteristics like men having a deeper voice, having more square shoulders, and more kind of square bodies in general, uh, where we grow our pubic hair, our deepening of our voice, uh, sometimes aggression as well is, is linked to testosterone, right? And so these are all factors that are coming from um, high levels of testosterone being produced uh, by the male genitalia, which came because of the TDF coming from the SRY gene. So the SRY gene leads to the production of TDF, which leads to the differentiation of the gonads into testes, which leads to high levels of testosterone, which leads to all of these other characteristics of the male. So ultimately it all comes down to the genes, but we can see the main hormone responsible for all this is testosterone, which is coming from the testes themselves. So in the other example, we'd be looking at the estrogen and progesterone levels. So again, if the gonad, the undifferentiated gonads, if they're not surrounded by any TDF, then they're not going to do any other special gene um, expression to create the testes and the other male reproductive organs. So it, it, um, the undifferentiated gomads develop normally using the X chromosomes as a guide to create the female reproductive system and ultimately the ovaries. And so the ovaries are in large numbers of, um, large amounts of estrogen and progesterone are going to be produced by the ovaries. All right, so the ovaries in very, very high concentration, and the fact that there's very, very low testosterone, we see the development of the female organs and ultimately the um, secondary sex characteristics of females. So this idea of the releasing of eggs versus the releasing of sperm, right? The um, development of breast tissue and pubic hair, the rounding of the hips, uh, normally there's links towards uh, the, the type of voice Normally it's more of a higher pitched voice because of the lack of testosterone. The quality of skin can also be linked to estrogen and progesterone rather than uh, levels of testosterone. And so we see uh, these uh, hormones having an effect on the female characteristics because they came from the ovary. And the reason why the ovary was developed is because there was a lack of the TDF because there was a lack of uh, the SRY gene or the Y chromosome. So in addition to understanding um, the hormones of the testes and the ovaries, and we're gonna get into the menstrual cycle and another series of notes, you have to know all the reproductive organs that go with both males and females. And so in a diagram like this, you should be able to name any one of these sections. So let's go through them. 
All right? So obviously you can pause it and try it on your own. All right, and so uh, I'll go through it now. So starting with A, here we go. They have the uterus, right, which is there for obviously um, for development of the fetus. It's the uh, kind of the womb where um, uh, an embryo will develop into the fetus and ultimately where the birth will begin. Uh, and so it's very, very thick muscular walls which are needed for the uh, birthing process, for the pushing of a, a child out of the uterus and uh, through the vagina. Then going to around the uterus on both sides, we have the fallopian tubes, or what is also called the oviduct. They're there to connect the ovaries to the uterus, and it's also where fertilization actually occurs. It doesn't occur in the uterus. The sperm move all the way up into the fallopian tubes, uh, and then that's where the egg and the sperm first meets, and the egg is fertilized, is in the fallopian tubes. C, of course, is the ovaries. Right? They're going to be there for storing the eggs. They're going to help develop and mature the eggs. They're where progesterone and estrogen are being secreted because they're the glands that are responsible for regulating the reproductive cycle for females. D is the endometrium, or which is the inner lining of the uterus. And so that's what's developing every month, eventually um, helping to create an area where the egg could be implanted if it is actually successful and there is a, a successful fertilization and the egg implants in the endometrium so that eventually it will develop in the placenta. So it's going to be that connection point between the, uh, the embryo and, uh, and the mother's circulatory system. Uh, if there is no successful fertilization, the endometrium is the layer of tissue and blood that is lost when a woman has her period uh, because it's not needed anymore. And so the whole cycle for the menstrual cycle um, uh, resets and so it resets by getting rid of the endometrium and then developing it again over the course of the next few weeks. Uh, for E, we have the cervix, which is a very narrow opening, um, which is there to help kind of protect the uterus from you know things getting in there. We don't want the uterus to have any type of you know bacteria or viruses you know getting in, especially if there's a developing. Um, uh, fetus. Also, the cervix is kind of there as a protective barrier against um, sperm. We only want the, the best sperm to get through, so there's actually a lot of obstacles that sperm have to get, their, get through in order to actually get to the egg, and the cervix is one of them. Uh, and Obviously, the cervix is going to open and widen during the process of birth, so the very, very painful contractions that people talk about, um, part of them will be the dilation of the cervix. It's going to have to increase in size in order, in diameter, uh, in order to fit the fetus when, or the, yeah, the fetus when during birth. Uh, F is the vagina. That's there for receiving the penis during sexual intercourse, and it's the first step the sperm are going to have to get through in order to get to um, the site for fertilization. And obviously, after the cervix is ready and fully dilated, that's the last part of the birth canal is through the vagina. Then the other organs you should recognize are also part of the excretory system. Uh, the excretory systems are connected to the reproductive systems in different ways, so you should also be aware of how they are represented or connected for both sexes. Obviously, G, we have the kidney. H, we have the ureters. Then the bladder. The bladder isn't to one side here. It's, it's actually this, this whole area back here. They just drew it just as one thing rather than uh, they drew it on one side versus the whole background, which is interesting. Uh, and then, of course, the urethra. Okay. And then, of course, we also you have to know all of the sections or the parts for the male reproductive system. Okay, so first starting at A, we have the vas deferens, which is the sperm duct. That's going to be responsible for carrying the sperm uh, to the penis for the process of ejaculation. B is the prostate gland, which is there for producing the fluid that's going to help uh, neutralize the acidity of the vagina. It also gives the nutrient solution that's there to provide the energy for the sperm as they travel through the, the whole process of going through sexual reproduction. C, of course, is the urethra. There is where sperm will be ejaculated, but that's also where urine is going to be released. So men have a single tube where both of those processes occur. D, of course, is the penis, which is there. Uh, it contains a lot of erectile muscle. When it floods with blood, uh, it normally becomes, it changes in shape. Uh, it becomes erect and much harder because uh, it's going to be used through the process of sexual reproduction with the vagina. 
When we go to E here, we're looking at the seminal vesicle. Again, that's the seminal vesicle along with the prostate gland are there to help add fluid and nutrients to the semen so that the semen, or so the sperm, so that the sperm can actually have the, the fluids necessary to go through sexual reproduction. Uh, of note, uh, until we pass through the prostate and seminal vesicles, it is just sperm. Once the sperm has moved through the area where these two uh, parts are, then it becomes semen. Okay. Uh, then we have the uh, epidemius, which is where the mature sperm are going to be stored uh, until later to be ejaculated. So millions of sperm can be stored in these, these folding um, uh, tubes, this really, really long section of, of uh, folded to back tubes. There's a lot of space for the sperm to be stored uh, leading up to the process of ejaculation. And then G, we have the testes, which of course are there for producing of testosterone, and it's where sperm are going to be produced. Again, millions of sperm are produced every day. And then we have the scrotum, which is basically a skin sac that holds the testes and other, you know, the epidemias and all that stuff outside of the body in order to have an optimum temperature for producing sperm. Uh, body temperature about 37 degrees, right? The optimum temperature for making sperm is actually below 37 degrees. And so uh, we have uh, testes outside of our body and they are just being a little bit further from the main part of our body. It allows them to be a little bit cooler environment in order to make sperm. I don't know if it picked up that last little part. Okay, that is it for this section. If you have any questions, uh, let me know.